Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist, an ichthyologist and also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of lower cards catfishes, which are also known as like plecos, uh, whiptail catfishes, stuff like that within the aquarium trade. I've also got like aquarium experience. So, um, well, within the trade anyway. So today's video, I'm going to talk about another fish food brand because I thought I'd go through different ones to help you identify what diets you should be feeding which sort of selection and giving you ideas on how to feed your fishes in general and also hopefully pushing the aquarium trade, the hobby, the whole thing to push for better diets, a better selection of diets, um, better sort of additives even to diets if you can't uh, create a whole diet, maybe just additives to an original diet and also just better understand your fish diets. So my background is a lot in like ecomorphology, so what, uh, how uh, morphology, how anatomy relates to diets um, of fishes. I also do uh, phylogenetics and other stuff to, uh, to do for evolution, but this is one of my sort of side interests. So today I'm going to review and talk about Tetra Pro Crisps. Tetra Prima I'm kind of going to add into this, but crisps I prefer for a variety of reasons. So I actually don't store mine in these because uh, these tubs are very long and tall. That means when, this is a, an ergonomics thing that uh, brands know what they're doing. And that's why some are so tall and narrow. And when you're grabbing in there, you're only grabbing a certain amount, which affects how you're feeding. I actually got given this uh, for trialling a fish food diet which you might have seen. If it's ever going to be available I don't know but I put uh, my general mix for uh, the discus and even the tetra usually in here. It's just easier to access, I know the amounts, uh, I can see it, it's just what I use for it. Um, the issue is once you've opened the packet, it will start deteriorating down, especially when it comes to oxygen. And the other aspect is it might start getting moist or uh, stale, sort of different aspects of food breaking down, whether it's a dry food and it gets a little bit moist and starts breaking down in that way, or it's a gel diet and it gets, um, or wet diet like vitality and it starts getting softer. So I just put mine in here and this, you can kind of see the consistency of the food right here. So you can see it is wafers and a lot of people don't like flake foods. So these are slightly thicker than flake foods. These are not, they won't break down as quickly. So I'm just going to pop some in the fish tank behind. So in this tank, I've the only shoaling fish I've got at the moment are tetra. So two different species of tetra, but you can see how they're feeding on. And I do break it down slightly. These wafers are a little bit bigger. They do have the teeth to break it down themselves. So I am actually a big fan of tetra pro crisps. And there's a variety of reasons why. Yes, a lot of flake foods get a lot of hate because they do break down a little bit quicker. These ones are a little bit slower to break down. It might be because they're thicker. But the benefit of flake foods, especially if you've got fishes that have smaller mouths, you can break it down a lot quicker. Granules can take a lot of time to break down. They might not even break down uh, before they sort of decay for a lot of smaller fishes. It just makes them a lot more viable for different fishes. I find the way these work, they don't sort of fall down too quickly. They don't float at surface. They're available for a wide range of fishes. The other aspect is, strangely, I've used these with a lot of success for a whole diversity of fishes. So fishes that are special scale eaters seem to like this. If you hit at the surface in the right way, so uh, these are lepidi lepidophagus fishes. Um, discus will eat it. Um, just a whole diversity of different fishes where Prima, Prima, Tetra Prima might not work. So it is a really great diet when it comes to that. And you might have seen there's several different packaging for it. And I don't think it matters whether you use the vegetable one as much. But the vegetable one isn't a herbivorous uh, version and I'll explain why. But this is a really useful sort of basic diet to have. The ingredients are not the greatest, but it offers sort of this baseline to then work off for different fishes where 
it might not be available, there might not be that baseline otherwise available. Discus are particularly a good example of that. So far, there isn't a dry diet that actually replicates their wild diet even closely, uh, given they're mostly feeding on like algae, detritus, um, stuff like that. So that's why I use mostly this, and this is mostly like fish meal and um, vegetables and cereals, so not the most ideal, but it offers a baseline. And the main thing, so I'll talk about this a lot, and you'll have these diets that have all sorts of ingredients. They might actually, say hypothetically you have a diet that replicates 100% of what the fish feed on in the wild, if the captive fish, whether they're captive fed or wild caught, don't feed on it, it's entirely pointless to use it. Even if they don't feed on it every time you try for years, they don't touch it, it's entirely pointless to use. So you want something that the fish will eat. And sometimes they won't eat the greatest diet for quite a while, but the main thing is to getting them eating. So that's why I actually have this diet. I don't kind of believe in the prebiotic stuff that it's promoting. Prebiotic depends on the fishes you're feeding. Because um, obviously prebiotic basically is an ingredient that feeds certain gut biota, certain gut bacteria, probably other organisms, I guess archaea and stuff, which are more closely related to animals. Uh, or eukaryotes, uh, which might confuse a few people but it's feeding them and obviously that's going to depend on what organisms that fish has in its gut so the same with probiotic i don't think it entirely works as simply as that and this is designed mostly for carp and similar fish so i'm going to discuss ingredients in a bit but anything else about it i think it gets fish feeding, a lot of fishes that wouldn't feed on any other diet, I've had arowana feed on it, like Asian arowana, another arowana, sometimes you just need a fish to feed, and sometimes you can't get a healthy diet for them to feed on, so you might as well resort to something they're actually going to eat, there's no point just starving the fish to death because you're like, oh they're not eating it. And you'll find that these ingredients are very similar to much more expensive diets that claim to uh, make all sorts of health claims that might not be entirely reliable. So I think this is cheap. This is around, I think, anywhere from like 9 to £12. Pounds. There's two different packaging. There's the American packaging and the British packaging. The American packaging, sometimes you'll find in like Maidenhead Aquatics. And Tetra is just a diet that you're going to find across the world easily. So it's kind of one of those more easier ones to discuss with people. It's not perfect, but it's good. So here on the back is where you should always look for ingredients. And it's kind of, why is it blurring only now? It's working yet. There we go. So this is where you'll find the ingredients. And sometimes it can be a little bit hidden. You'll rarely find it on the front of the product. So we have the brand, the product, um, name, um, the fact it's multi crisps, which kind of I guess assumes it's varying in size. I don't think uh, it kind of is a reliable estimate of size, which is fine for some, but the good thing about flakes is you can break it down for smaller fishes, even for fry. And then we've got premium. And remember, with certain legislation, it's only a complete food if it goes through, has every ingredient the animal needs to live. With fishes maybe there's a little gap here on understand their science isn't quite full like uh, with dog diets and stuff like that complete means it's got everything in it the f animal needs to live. With fishes it might be a little bit more complex than that and highly nutritious due to gentle manufacturing. So this is particularly interesting I think gentle manufacturing I assume means uh, rather than uh, cooking and stuff like that it's a very different sort of processing of the ingredients. Uh, there's, I don't usually look at these sort of things. I go straight to ingredients, especially when I'm looking at new diets. So first here, so fish and fish derivatives is a really interesting one. As fish and fish derivatives just means fish meal. It's kind of like the waste products um, or waste fishes in a way. 
Then we've got similar, uh, but we've got vegetable protein extract. So this is going to increase that protein value that a lot of people care about a lot. So the thing is with fish and fish derivatives, firstly, is that unless your fish is a piscivore, which very few fishes we keep in the creme trade are piscivores. Let me get a pen because it really hates uh, my fingers um, showing it. Um, I'm just, just because this is a branded pen, I don't really want to show off the branding just in case. But yeah, so this, unless your fish is a piscivore, it won't benefit as much from the fish and fish derivatives. A lot of the minerals might not be as accessible just due to gut biota, enzymes, stuff like that, biology of the fish's digestive system. And bear in mind, this is a general diet. So the problem is, is that fish diet, fishes have a wide range of different diets. There's no one diet, many are not what you think of as omnivores. Omnivore is just such a vague term. So when you think about feeding your fishes, this is not what I'd feed for a lot of fishes ideally. This is kind of like where there's not really a baseline to feed off and then I'm working, um, exploring a bit more in those additives. And that's because brands haven't really provided much. So then we have this vegetable protein extracts. And a lot of people argue, oh, doesn't this work for herbivorous fishes? Well, firstly, a lot of herbivorous fishes that we keep do not eat macrophytic plants. They might eat uh, stuff like bryophytes, which is uh, moss, uh, liverwort, stuff like that. But no, they do not eat many of these. And the ones they do eat are not similar to vegetables we eat. And it's likely they cannot extract as much nutrients from this. This is not the same nutritional profile that they'd require. Okay, so when think about these ingredients and diets like this, this is actually backed by certain science. And the science is actually focused more on aquaculture or fish that you're going to eat. Uh, so mostly carp, maybe channel catfish, maybe tilapia. But it's very much looking at the short term, looking at mainly getting the fish growing as quickly as possible. So that's why you might see, uh, well, these sorts of ingredients are so common. And they say they're scientifically based, and to a degree that's true, because it's based on the science of fish feeds for aquaculture for food fishes. So they're not wrong there. The problem is, is the aims and therefore the ingredients differ when you're thinking about ornamental. And these ingredients, actually, there's a lot of different sort of where they use different words for the same thing. So you'll see the same. Fish meal, vegetable, cereals. So cereals are an interesting one. I have seen the suggestion that these can lead to issues with the liver in fishes. So ideally, and they're very different from what our fishes eat in the wild, although they might replicate where diet is very difficult to digest. And vegetables might be more similar to what we well, what fishes will have as fruits will be maybe more similar to vegetables, but vegetables are a very broad name. I assume it's like potatoes, peas, uh, probably actually pea protein extract rather than vegetables. That's quite a common one. Um, peas are nitrogen fixers. It doesn't make them easy to digest, and I, they can be a little bit gassy. If you go down here, you've got yeasts. Yeasts do have a nutritional benefit. Um, it's all very generic, oils and fats, what is an oil and a fat? Obviously, the scientific term of an oil and fat is very different. Mollusks and crustaceans are basically invertebrates, um, various sugars, so that they're only mentioning the oligofructose, which I guess is because it's a varied one, and a bit of algae. And even in the herbivorous ones, you'll see that little bit of algae. So this is a very generic diet. It's mostly based on fi food fishes. And you'll see this across different fish diets. If you look at the ingredients, you'll see fish and fish derivatives or fish meal, krill meal, vegetables. And um, this is more extracting the protein, I guess, from it. It's a bit more precise. Cereals, yeast, oils, 
Um, well, generally it's those big three you'll see, and then the rest kind of blur into it. Algae is always at the bottom. When it comes to ingredients, the first ingredient is always the largest. So as you're going down, it's got the least. So this is not a diet I'd want to feed algivores if possible. And this is the thing when it comes to fishes. Diets might not actually cater for the way certain fishes feed, which is why I use it. Discus don't generally like gel diets. They like to feed off the surface or they like to feed off the water column. It has to move a little bit. Gel diets don't really work in that way. So then obviously we've got the constitu constituents, which I net. So in the science, um, in papers, in the literature, Yes, protein does have a value, but it's more important generally where that protein comes from. This is a very high percentage of protein compared to other diets. It's 46%. So this is generally seen often as a carnivorous diet, but it doesn't mean that this protein is accessible. It's mostly coming from that probably fish meal, vegetable protein. Probably quite a bit from the algae and the crustaceans, the mollusks. But this crosses out algivores ideally. And this protein, always think about where that protein comes from. Don't look at where that protein, what, like the value of protein, because that's very short term. Just because it's high in protein doesn't mean that fish is going to be living long. Doesn't mean it's going to be... Um, reproducing for long. So a diet like this might or could affect a fish's a reproductive lifespan but sometimes this is all you've got and that's why I think it's a really valuable diet for that. A lot of fish seems like it and it's not really clear why. There's been like suspicions. Got crude fat, crude fibre. Fibre is very different how it functions with fishes. Crude fat. This has generally been discussed as more important when it comes to ornamental fishes affecting how they breed and also I guess a coloration has been mentioned. Moisture content. So all diets, even dry diets, will have this moisture content. Um, what it doesn't actually include is how it's mineral content. And a lot of people will say, oh, but I don't see a percentage for minerals. Actually, as I discussed in my previous video about Vashi Soil and Green, if you see ash mentioned, ash is actually the mineral content of the diet. So ash isn't about how, it's not ash at all. It's just about how, once you burn the diet, how many minerals come out. There's some interesting things here, vitamin D3, so that's vitamin D, that, um, so the hormone, I guess, or what can be taken up as the hormone. I'm not entirely clear on that, it's the bit I never got off reptiles that I never quite understood. But that's in there because obviously they're not getting much from the diet. Obviously the fish meal should contain quite a bit. Most carnivorous feeds do, the only ones that don't are like insect meals can be a little bit hit and miss. We've got trace elements, these are what you'd get in the mineral content, the ash. And then the very vague one, colorants, preservatives, not antioxidants. These are in a lot of diets. You might see short ingredients this, but they're just vague on these particularly. Antioxidants, the science is a little bit sort of unclear. We have obviously best before, always keep an eye on that, an out of date diet might not have the mineral content or the vitamin or the nutrient content you ideally want. But oh, this diet is actually really good for just getting fishes feeding. The ingredients might not be great but fishes will eat it and it's a good starting block if it's not a basic diet. It's just a starting block if you're struggling to get fishes feeding and then moving on to them as something elsewise. It could also be used alongside maybe frozen foods or um, as live foods if you're not able to get as much diversity. So maybe 10 or more species or different uh, live foods or frozen foods, then something like this could offer or boost the nutrition kind of on the side so it's not a whole thing 
because if you're feeding only frozen or live, you might be missing out on certain things. So anyway, I wanted to kind of give a view of a diet that's very different to, there's no good, there's no strict good and bad. There's kind of different aspects of good and bad. And good diets doesn't mean that nutritionally they're the best, but they might be good for where you are at the time. So I'll end this video here and I've got plenty of other diets to review. Um, some I can't provide footage of fishes eating them because especially catfish diets. But if you like my videos please comment, like and subscribe and goodbye.